Delighted to have Lord Jim O'Neill here with us today at King's Business School. So Lord O'Neill is former chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, former UK Treasury Minister. He's a member of the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development and the vice chair of the Northern Pow Powerhouse Partnership. He's also non-executive chairman of Northern Gritstone, which we'll talk about. It's an investment company founded by the University of Leeds, Manchester, and Sheffield. Uh, and it's aimed at facilitating the commercialization of university science and technology related to the IP in the north of England. So today we're going to talk about macroeconomic performance, particularly of the BRICS. Um, and uh, at a more micro level, we are talking about the UK, particularly the, um, Lord O'Neill's work in building entrepreneurial ecosystems in the north of the country. So first, the famous BRICS, uh, BRIC yep. being the term that you coined in 2001. St stamped on my forehead forever. <laughs> so, and it refers, of course, to the emerging economies <clears throat> of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Mm -hmm. Now, today is just over 20 years later. Now, you once said that perhaps you should have called the BRICS the X or the ICs, uh, given the extent to which Russia and Brazil underperformed. Mm -hmm. What's your sense today? What are the prospects for, for Russia and Brazil and the X? Yeah. 21 years it is now, actually. And it's... Uh like a football match, it's sort of been a game of two halves. I mean, the first decade, all four of them uh, did very well. Uh, the second half of, of the BRICS era so far uh, has been, until a few years ago, incredible for China, pretty good for India, and a disaster for Brazil uh, and Russia. So much so that Brazil and Russia's share of global GDP is actually back to where it was 21 years ago. So there's no two ways about it. Those two places, 21 years later, have hugely disappointed. And unless they can deal with the so-called commodities curse, like many other emerging countries that happen to be rich in commodities but seem to waste them, particularly in Latin America, um, they're never going to reach the potential that, that I once helped make popular. The other two, um, and therefore I would say economically in the aggregate, the whole thing uh, lives on because, of course, despite China's own considerable challenges, it's easily the second most important economy in the world and it's still likely to threaten to be bigger than the US in the next decade. And India has now emerged or already quite clearly as the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, and because of the two of them, they, those two in the US essentially drive marginal developments in the world economy. And of course, because of it all, we do have this BRICS political club that you know, their leaders treat seriously. I'm not sure they ever do a great deal with it, but you know, it's become a thing in the world. Yeah, it's incredible to, to coin a term and then have it become an actual... <laughs> yeah, I uh, often joke that they never ask me uh, whether they could do it or, or they never invited me to be the president. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so again, if we go back to the 21 years ago, mm -hmm. to paint the picture, so China was then freshly joining the, the WTO, yep. upgrading its technological capacity, uh, and, and speaking of your sort of game of two halves, in that half, in that mm -hmm. era, China was often accused of, of copying ideas and processes from, from elsewhere, not paying attention to intellectual property domestically. Fast forward to today, in many sectors and technologies, perhaps other than semiconductors, where many will say that China is still, still yeah. lagging the technological frontier. China is a leader at the world's frontier. Uh, so thinking of TikTok, Alibaba, solar panels, and more. So how would you describe China today versus China in 2001 in terms of that world leading uh, capability, not only economic size? I mean, very different. Uh, I would say that actually as far ago as uh, 2010, indeed, maybe the financial crisis made the Chinese uh, follow one of the few things I've learned in my professional 40 years of existence, that never let a crisis go to waste. And I think 
their realization through the 2008 financial crisis that they were so excessively dependent on cheap exports to the rest of the world, it forced them to, to change. Um, and you highlighted many of the areas where, as a producer, uh, they've become pretty powerful. But um, a very important issue, and I think we'll touch on it um, with some of the other questions maybe, that what allows China to do it, which I think a lot of people underestimate, is an obvious. You know, it's a country of 1.4 billion people. So, so there is a huge domestic market. And most of the successes that, including many of the ones you cited, with a possible exception of uh, TikTok, are really big in China. Uh, and in terms of the health of the global economy, that's something that it's kind of easy to say, but I think a lot of people don't appreciate the subtlety of it because for the world economy to be better and more balanced, uh, we can't just live on the back of the United States, which until China emerged is essentially what the whole of Europe was doing and much of the emerging world too. So in that sense, it's kind of meant we have a two-engine world. The fact that they both spend a lot of time now fighting each other about anything is, is a rather unfortunate development. But economically, it's made the world a bit more healthy than it used to be, in my view. That there's genuine competition at that level. And, and maybe sticking with that and thinking about the work of people uh, like Kai-Fu Lee and, and his work on the AI superpowers and this obsession with who's going to win yeah. the race, yeah. uh, be it in artificial intelligence or others. What's your view in the in that sphere of who has and who's likely to persist as as the leader? Comparing what often happens, the sort of the bats to the I think it's the mama now, but it was yeah. uh, you know the the American tech giants. You know, I mean, I don't know. Uh, and secondly, I would add, from my view of an idealized world. I don't think it really matters. I mean, it's fun. And of course, from a nationalistic ego perspective, uh, seemingly big countries want to be sure that they win. But for the health of the world, it's pretty good if they're just trying to keep on competing, albeit in as friendly a way as possible. And so uh, it's better for the world if there's different alternatives rather than it's got to be one or the other. Um, within the BRICS context or the emerging market space, uh, a sort of distant cousin of the same is who will ultimately win between China and India, which in my view is a bit of a stupid exercise too. They can both win if they're more sensible, but um, it's quite clear on, on some areas, possibly because of the ease in which the Chinese state backs things it wants to be winners, they've done very well. And actually, despite how much fuss the US makes about it, the US is trying to back more and more things domestically that it wants to win. And so, not that US policymakers would ever admit it, but in a way, they've sort of thought, oh, okay, that's kind of how you do some of this. And, and obviously, China would never admit it, but the way they adopted some uh, of demo Western democratic capitalism values, particularly attracting foreign direct investment to help bring them the know-how, uh, they've done that. And uh, you know, as I say, if we could ignore some of the huge things, which of course we can't, to, go, to get where we got to pre-COVID, I thought made the world a much healthier place. There's more convergence and more similarities than maybe yeah, each side would, so. would let on. I mean, sticking with the, the policy and, and your point about sort of the, the American side wouldn't admit uh, their sort of engineering or, or governing mm. the market. Thinking of, you know, Senator Rubio led um, an amazing, uh, was it the Small Business Economic Committee uh, report in 2019 that I found fascinating that was the U.S. response to China's made in 2025, which was the most explicit recognition yeah. that this was something they were worried about and that the U.S. needed to formalize a response that also went to, to steer the market. If we look then at the, the Chinese side in the mm -hmm. policy realm, which Chinese policies or the ways in which the Chinese government, you know, how, how has Beijing steered the market in a way that's been effective? You know, uh, I have contradictory views in my mind about that right at this moment in time, because I think uh, the China that I've followed for 
actually the best part of 35 years quite closely. In the past few years, has been one that I haven't really understood. I actually joked with some senior Chinese policymakers this year, more, on more than one occasion, that maybe I never really understood China all along. It was just a coincidence. Because when I look at some of the policy decisions they've taken, including the style of the sort of COVID lockdown, but also how they've aggressively interfered with certain industries, it's not obvious to me that that's good uh, for China's long-term economic development. Um, and I keep thinking, well, what is it I'm missing? Because they've normally been so logical, and, and by the way, as part of it, really powerfully responsive to external crises, not just 08, but also the Asian crisis in 98. And so I don't know whether it's because they might be going a bit off track under the the third term that's just beginning of President Xi, or there's a subtlety that I don't yet appreciate. If it were that, and now turning to the positive side of the, of the tone of what I've said, it, it does look like they spend a lot of time thinking about these are the things we want to ensure that are going to be really important for our economy and society in the future, and so we want to back them. Uh, and I think... Again, if you look subtly at build back better, which is a Joe Biden mantra, and, and we kind of have a bit of that here in the UK and the Europeans do, you know, again, because of the politics of it, nobody would ever dare say, but there's a flavour of that. Uh, and of course, the Indians are doing it now under Modi too. Uh, there's a flavour of that all over the place. When I, when I really reflect uh, of how policymaking has conducted itself in a lot of my adult lifetime, there is something quite uh, admirable about the Chinese system's ability to broadly plan and stick to what it wants to develop. Um, and if India could do more of that than its own 1.4 billion people, which is probably right now in the stage, stage of becoming more populated than China, they would be even more successful than they are. And especially if I apply that to our, our sorry full country that's still six years later struggling with Brexit and not really knowing after five prime ministers later what it wants to do about that much. You know, we could do with a lot of that here. So the, uh, a visible hand of the market that's useful actually in marshalling resources and, and steering investment in a way that's towards the, the direction. I mean, you know, I don't want to sound all, you know, grand socialist leader type, but when I look at the way global capitalism has developed um, compared to what I learned in the textbooks, some parts of it have gone wrong. Uh, we've had, uh, since the financial crisis, an era of dramatically low interest rates, uh, quite a lot of tax incentives for the private sector, seemingly never-ending rising profits by and large until the past two years. And none of that has led to uh, a big rise in investment spending by private sector businesses or improvements in productivity. That is not supposed to happen. Uh, and one of the reasons we're struggling with so many of these challenges in the UK, in Europe, in the US, is because of this weak productivity in the state, partly because of the debts that many of countries have got, don't want to or don't feel they can do the role of being the, the the provider of all this investment spending but you know china doesn't sit there worrying about all this stuff it just does it it chooses strategic yeah. technologies and yeah, sectors and directs us impressive. there if we take that and we and we shift towards your work with the northern yeah. powerhouse and building yeah. entrepreneurial ecosystems which yeah. in my own work find fascinating because it's this combination of top down and and steering and directing yeah. but then also uh, encouraging you know a thousand flowers to bloom. So, yeah. so you've been involved in the Northern uh, Powerhouse, um, and as chairman of Northern Gritstone, are focusing on a post-industrial economy. Yeah. Um, so, what lessons from maybe China specifically, or your BRICS analysis more broadly, would you apply to this ecosystem building in the the Northern context? It's a really interesting question. Um, that I have thought about it before, but it's not one I reflect on a lot. But. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I was involved in the creation of the whole concept of the Northern Powerhouse. And at, at its core, which Gritstone's 
uh, creation represents uh, is what I uh, sometimes refer to as another acronym which hasn't become as popular as BRICS, which I call Manchester Leedspool. You know, the centre of Manchester, 35 miles uh, west to Liverpool, 35 miles east to Sheffield, 35 miles northeast to Leeds, all the area within that contains as many people as London. And if you can uh, get all of that to be a single market for producers and consumers, whilst respecting all the individual uh, pride and history of those places, you've got something for the UK on the same scale as London. And London is, as we know, this enormously important economic entity um, that is just an amazing thing. And if you could get another one, it would be huge. So that's what the core Northern Powerhouse concept is about. And of course, to your question, the Chinese did that uh, very well as part of the early stages of this second phase that we talked about earlier, when they essentially deliberately moved a lot of business west inside China. Uh, and places like Chongqing emerged as these huge uh, metropolitan centers, which was essentially bringing other places together. And so those things are at the core uh, of the whole idea of the Northern uh, Powerhouse and why the never ending debate about Northern Powerhouse Rail. Uh, because, you know, to put it in the context of trains, the central tube line is uh, longer than the distance between Manchester and any of these places. And if you had transport to allow people to use those in the same easy way that we're all now using the Elizabethan line in London, hey presto, it makes it easier. On Gritstone, uh, as you said in the intro, three of those four are anchor universities to Gritstone. Um, and one of the other things, which is not really a, a lesson from uh, China directly, but it's the, one of the lessons I've learned in my career is, what is it that this country has that's truly unique? What is it the North has that's truly unique? And, and uh, one of the really few things is we have 16 universities, including this one, which are frequently recognized as being in the world's top 100. That's four times bigger than the UK's share of global GDP. It's a higher representation than the United States. And yet many of those universities, particularly the ones in the North, are in really weak places of productivity and ones with proud but weakened history of uh, mining industry and so on. And so if we can help harness the brilliant ideas coming out of those universities and turn them into uh, successful, help turn them into successful commercial businesses, crucially, that are employing lots of value-added people in those places, you know, that's cr transforming the Northern Powerhouse into something that's going to be a success. Absolutely, this idea of the, the entrepreneurial university that in, an, in its own campus boosts uh, yes. innovation, but then also importantly has this third mission and, and, and benefits the, the local regions. You, you mentioned rail earlier, you had mentioned taxes, and just thinking about from if we come back to the policy perspective, mm -hmm. and maybe if we, because we're sitting here in London, if we zoom out to the, the tech nation, yeah. um, which policy strings do you think are the priorities? Is it infrastructure? Is it, is it rail? Is, is it incentivizing investment? Uh, all of them. Um... As it relates to the Northern Powerhouse, I frequently say there are six different ingredients that are all necessary to deliver long-term success. None of them on their own will do it, and that's uh, infrastructure, especially transport, devolution, more powers. We are an idiotically centrally run country, one of the most of, in the OECD, so a lot more devolution of powers uh, and ability to spend. Um, better skills much better basic education. Third, more business being geographically dispersed, huge advantage for you guys here. You have so many uh, major global business leaders in the same place. And then sixthly, uh, which is a crucial but subtle one, is you need the mindset, and it's not just true for the North, by the way, it's also true in the Midlands and perhaps in the Southwest. You need a mindset of not wanting to default to oh, we, you know, we were such a great place and we were so good at this. You've got to accept that there are powerful global forces out there 
that now mean a lot of people want to go on planes and have summer holidays with guaranteed sun rather than you know Blackpool or Scarborough or even Cornwall. And so they, they can't ever be what they once were. And, you know, coal mining and shipbuilding are never going to come back uh, or cotton producing or wool producing. So you've got to, got to move on and, and, and have an open mind and with it a proper focused spirit to try and create something different. And the universities are right at the core of it. And as it relates to the North, uh, in, a, in, a, in a world where we're trying to deal with climate change, all the main things on alternative energies are in the North. Uh, our best uh, capabilities in advanced manufacturing are in the North. Uh, and they're pretty good at life sciences too. They're not unique in that sense. There's plenty of other parts of the country. But building on those thing, things with the universities at the center of it, it seems to me the way to truly try and turn the North into something, again, prosperous, but not the same as it used to be. That's a great positive uh, note to to end on. I just thank you so much. It's really it's my pleasure. fascinating. This I appreciate your candid insights and uh, I'm sure that our viewers will very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to hear where you see both things developing and what needs to happen here in the UK, but then also the, the BRICS or the, the X uh, 20 <laughs> years later. So All thank right. you very well, much. Thanks very Jim. much for having me do it. I enjoyed thank it. Thank you.